Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Megan Shamus. Please come in, gather. We're just going to get started here in just a moment. So um, this track this afternoon is really dedicated to fundamentals. Um, we're going to start with the 101 on pass keys, and then we're going to go into some considerations around um, pass keys in the enterprise, as well as in regulated industries. And then we're going to do a, a really lovely session around the importance of UX um, in authentication deployments, but more specifically with pass keys. So first up um, is our pass keys 101. We're very lucky, lucky to have Tim Capali here to provide that to you. Tim is not only a contributor to the FIDO Alliance, but also to the W3C and the WebAuthn specifications. And if anyone is the right person to give a 101, it's Tim. So please help me to welcome Tim Capali. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, you got to go that way. Stay here. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, this is going to be a very, very high level. We'll go um, a little bit of framing. We'll do a little bit of technical, but really the rest of the sessions this week uh, should dive a lot deeper into this stuff. Um, so my name is Tim Gabali. I'm at Microsoft. Uh, I work on standards, just standards, mostly in the passwordless space. Um, so if, if you're all here, right, we all know that how prevalent phishing has become, right? These four actual screenshots are actually from the last four months, right? And those are some pretty big attacks that have happened. So I'm not going to go into why we need phishing resistance. Um, the favorite quote from one of our executives at Microsoft, hackers don't break in, they just log in, right? They're not trying all that hard these days. Um, so what we've done over the past two decades, right, to try and address this is we've had usernames and passwords, right? We've layered on OTP, typically via SMS. That's expensive. Uh, then we've added app-based OTP, but you need the user to install your app. Then we added email OTP, miserable experience if you've ever been through it. Um, and then app push came, right? So you don't actually have to enter the number, but you have to click yes. And as you saw in Pam's keynote this morning, not a good user experience, and it's very fishable. So the, the other patterns that came along were, OK, let's get rid of the password altogether and add username plus magic link. I don't know about you, but these are the most insufferable user experiences, but I understand why you need them, right? <laughs> but as a personal end user, uh, they're just very, very frustrating. And then my favorite one that came was username, then OTP, then password. So flip, flip the narrative, right? So I guess if you know the OTP, um, then you don't, you don't bust the password as much. Like just really bad things. And I'm, so, I'm not meaning this to be critical, but this is what you had to do to secure your accounts, um, right? And then the new one is username, magic link, then password, right? So not optimal, right? Um, these are all fishable one, and then you add in a bunch of fishable options on the other end, right? So not ideal, right? So what could we do? Well, a few years back, probably seven years now, they said, OK, let's add a security key, right? So username, then password, then a security key. And that's really awesome, because those were phishing resistant, and are phishing resistant, not were. Um, and that's really great. So let's take a technical detour into phishing resistance. I'm going to keep going back and forth from the fundamentals into some of the, the, the technical topics. What does phishing resistance mean in this context? Right? For us, it means a combination of proximity Right? So the idea that you might have your laptop and you have an authenticator in the laptop, which is literally soldered to your motherboard and in theory can't come out without physical access. Um, and then you have things that plug in or, or tap or connect locally. Right? USB is probably the most common security key uh, interface. But you can also use Bluetooth, right? but you have to pair it to the device. Um, and then NFC, which if I had my way, we would just all be doing NFC and tap. But unfortunately, like laptops and desktops don't typically come with an NFC reader. Um, so those combinations uh, really give us the proximity check, making sure the authenticator is nearby to the client and the resource you're trying to access. The second piece, which you'll hear a lot more um, as NIST uh, works on revision four, because it's explicitly named now, is verifier name binding. Um, this is really what gives you the binding of the credential to the origin. So if we were to say, I have a credential for login.captoso.com, uh, my username is not necessarily relevant here, just for illustration. But when I go to login.captoso.com in my browser or another app, that should pass. It's an exact name match to the, the name that was created when I created the credential. Now, if I were to go to login.captoso.com.site.xyz, and this may seem funny, but this is one of the most popular phishing tactics out there, because the more stuff you add to the right-hand side, the further it uh, masks it in the address bar. So this is a very, very common pattern. Uh, this wouldn't work. right? It doesn't match. It's not login.captoso.com. Most obvious one that's not going to match, myaccount.com, completely separate. Now, the last one's a trick, login.captoso.com. Again, right? No. Let me change the font. It's actually an I at the beginning. 
right? So little tricks that, that hackers like to do in, to fish you in the browser, um, these are all solved, right? So username, password, security key. Problem solved, right? And I just had to use our awesome new Windows 11 emojis. I'll probably get in trouble, but uh, they're awesome, right? Right, right, this should all be solved, right? Security keys, well, nope, unfortunately, they're not. As we all know, security key adoption is low in consumers. You still need a password. You need multiple security keys, and it's a very, very confusing user experience. And we've even seen growing pains with some of the newer technology. User experience is obviously, as you all know, the most important piece here. So what if we had one credential that was phishing resistant with a great user experience, and that was always available when you need it? That's where we get into pass keys. So what are passkeys? At their very, very highest level, you know, everyone in tech likes to iterate on names and we get stuck in our, our big bubble of trying to name things. But at the end of the day, when you're explaining this to friends and family, uh, they're replacements for passwords. That's all users need to know. Um, and the key at the bottom is, and all the baggage that comes with them, right? If we think about all the things I showed, SMS, OTP, app-based, those were all layered onto these things over the years because the first factor was fishable. The first factor is no longer fishable. Why do we need all this, right? Why do we need to bolt on these miserable experiences? So let's think of pass keys in four pieces, right? We obviously have the pass key as the credential, but realistically, if you're reading the tech press, you're reading The Verge, all these articles, they're, they're really talking about this as a industry forward moment that's more than a credential, right? So you often hear about pass keys as an experience. So if we break out the experience into four major pieces, it's a new name, right? We've never really had a name before. It's a new icon. It's a new flavor, I like to use flavor, uh, and new features. So let's jump into the name first. At its core, we've had kind of four big buckets of names for these credentials in the past, right? Discoverable credentials, if you're a techie looking at WebAuthn. FIDO credentials has kind of been the generic umbrella term. WebAuthn discoverable credentials, for those who want to be super specific. And then the more generic FIDO2 credentials referring to the second iteration of the specifications. Let's just simplify all that and call these pass keys, right? Super easy to remember both for a tech crowd and a consumer crowd um, in all different verticals, right? Like at the end of the day, even at work, you remember, like, your users are consumers that just happen to be at work, right? So super easy to remember these types of things. So the next one, I want a little bit of audience. Um, actually, sorry, quick. The animations messed me up. Sorry, my own animations. So we have a password and a pass key, just like we have passwords and pass keys, right? Super easy. I've tested this on my parents. After, like, explaining it to them once, they're like, oh, yeah, I get it. And now they can answer, I know what a pass key is, right? That was one of the goals with this term. Super easy to remember. It's a common noun. No one owns it. There's no capital P, no capital K. It's just, like, password. But what actually is it? Let's take a quick tech detour again. Um, what, is that, what is the credential itself? Like, what, what does it actually mean? And really, it's just a bunch of metadata with some keys, right? So at the end of the day, every credential needs to have some kind of identifier that is usually unique to the authenticator that you're authenticating with. There needs to be a private key, right, which is kept private, the public key, which is sent to the relying party. You need some kind of user identifier that kind of identifies that user account in the credential itself. You need a relying party identifier, which is typically in the web, going to be the domain name. We talked about that a minute ago. Uh, and then you need some kind of metadata to show to the user, right? So in the case of me having a credential for Captoso, it may say my username of Tim, and the relying party name may be Captoso. And that's really to help users in those selection screens that I'm sure you've all seen now um, find the right credential, especially if there's more than one. So I'm going to throw these, these icons on the on the screen. How many people have a high level expectation when they see these of what they can do, right? If you're at a store or you're at an airport, right? A lot of hands going up, right? This is the tap to pay icon. You generally have an idea that when you see this, I can tap my phone, tap my card, whatever it may be, and get a very specific experience. That doesn't exist for sign in on the web. We heard uh, Derek talk about that in his keynote earlier. So technically, there was a FIDO icon before. <laughs> I put question marks. Um, but now we have this great thing with the passkey icon that anyone is free to use as a relying party. So the idea that users, when they see a sign in with a passkey button, they can get some level of expectation. Realistically, it's going to be like, I'm going to get Windows Hello, or I'm going to get Touch ID. And that's just the way we, we associate things in our heads. And that's fine. But they know what's coming, right? They know what the next experience is going to be. And that's really important if we want this to be literally replace passwords on the web. So the next one is a new flavor, right? I think of it like ice cream. Uh, and this is synced pass keys, right? So the idea, one of, one of the things I mentioned was this has to be available whenever the user needs it. Now, if you've ever had security keys, they're great, they're super secure, everything's great, but you have to have it with you. Like I actually, 
got my new Pixel 8 the other day and I was sitting by the pool here and I couldn't set it up because I had to go back to my room to get my security key, right? Like, so it's just, the, when you think about that with end users, that might be okay at work, but we're not gonna get users to use security keys for their everyday life. Um, so the idea here is that these can securely sync with your ecosystem of choice. It may be the platform, it may be uh, someone like 1Password or Dashlane or Bitwarden, um, but that's your choice as a user, and you choose who, uh, which experience is best for you, what maybe even security levels work for you. Maybe you want to pick a provider that requires security keys to actually recover your past keys, right? The world that I would love to see is that the tech-centric folks who, like, I must use security keys, use security keys to protect your passkey provider, and then use your passkey provider for everything else. Right? That's a really nice balance that gives you the really great user experiences, but make sure those high value accounts are protected. And you may be asking, what about security keys? They haven't gone anywhere, especially at Microsoft. We think security keys are still as relevant than ever, more relevant than ever, you could argue. Um, and those are now just device-bound passkeys. Right? So if you think of a security key as an authenticator, those authenticators hold device-bound passkeys. The other popular device-bound passkey authenticator that's out there is Windows Hello for Business as a platform authenticator. So they haven't gone anywhere. We just, again, have a really nice name, uh, more of a technical audience name. We don't typically want to use synced and device-bound with end users, but it is important when you're configuring policies and when you're communicating to admins and other things that, uh, especially for regulatory requirements, that this is a device-bound key um, and it should just be a kind of derivative flavor of this, this new term. Now, if you look at features, there's two main big main features that we added to support passkeys. One is the autofill UI, and the other is cross-device authentication. Now, let's dig into the autofill UI for a second. So this is GitHub. Uh, they just deployed. Super happy about that. Um, and they're using actually all of the features, right? They're supporting cross-device. They're supporting autofill UI. It's a really you know one of the best deployments out there, in my opinion. Um, so we really have a couple of benefits: familiar user experience, right? So users are used to whether it's from the browser or from their favorite password manager, something that comes down or some modal that pops from their username field. So the, one of the problems with FIDO previous to this effort was users didn't know they actually had a credential. You kind of had to know you had it or you had to know to click the button. And with a combination of like no friendly name, no icon, and not a lot of buttons out there, it was a really awkward user experience. The user would end up re-registering, and then you get told you already have a credential and go back. So this solves it. It's a very familiar user experience. They just tap it and away they go. It is an easy addition to existing sign-in pages, right? So this is actually super easy to add. It's literally, you add a web authn tag to your username field, and you essentially make the same request you would make when you hit the button in the background when the page loads. That's it. The browser takes it from there. And the last one is really important. It's dynamic and privacy preserving. So while you do that very basic setup, you add the tag, you add the call, this is rendered by the, the client, by the browser. So the, the relying party does not get any information until you the user taps on the credential and does their biometric. So there's no information disclosed as the exact same privacy and security model as, as clicking a button, for example, which is super important. The next one is cross-device authentication. Um, this is super important for bootstrapping, right? We're gonna be in a world for a few years where you're not gonna have a passkey for, uh, let's say, uh, in this example, Hyatt, on your desktop, right? But you may have one on your phone. So instead of leaving you stranded and only using a fishable credential on desktop, let's use your passkey from your phone. So this is a live example. You can try this. Um, this is live on Hyatt. So I go to Hyatt, I click on the email field, I get a conditional UI thing that says, hey, uh, you, you want to use another device? This is the brand new functionality in Windows. I click on my Pixel, I get a push notification. It's going to say, hey, do you want to use your passkey for Hyatt? Click continue, quick biometric check, and I am signed in. All right, that happened across device using native stuff baked into the OS, baked into both devices' OSs, uh, and then it was completely phishing resistant. Right, so that was one of the last pieces of glue we really needed to bring this full circle. The three major use cases we see for cross device auth is bootstrapping. And you know, in theory, you only have to bootstrap once, right? When you have a passkey, let's say, in Google Password Manager, and then you want to create a passkey on Windows, that's only a process you really need to do once. But there's two other major areas where we think this is important, both at home and at work. One is shared devices, right? Uh, even at home, right? There's iPads people share, family computers. You may not want to sync all your credentials to every device. Um, and then the, in the work uh, environments, the example I like to use is think of a gate agent at an airport. They're constantly signing in and out of those terminals. They probably don't have any local biometrics on those devices. Being able to quickly and easily sign in cross-device uh, using the thing that everyone's already carrying. They're probably issued by the airline uh, to have a phone. You can use that for a quick sign-in across devices. 
And the last one is temporary access. How many times have you gone to someone's house, you just want to stream something really quick, you don't necessarily want to leave your, uh, even just your Netflix signed in, right? Being able to quickly do a cross-device auth, not have to fumble and be on the same network and all the stuff that happens today. While those experiences have gotten better, they are still fishable, but fishing someone for their Netflix access probably isn't the most high value, uh, high value problem to solve. So let's recap why passkeys are important. One is that it's a unique credential per service, right? That happens, that happens automatically. The user doesn't have to think about this. When you create a passkey, it is unique to that service. It can't be used by design on another site. And now that brings up, I'm sure you'll hear about it this week, it's a very, very different model from other technologies like federation or verifiable credentials, which are designed to be reused per service. So they're literally on opposite sides of the camp by design. That's, what, that's one of the reasons these are phishing resistant. They are standards based. As you probably know, you're at a FIDO conference, phishing resistant, asymmetric cryptography without a PKI. I feel like I've heard a lot of people explain FIDO as with a PKI, there's no PKI involved, right? You don't need to set up a CA, none of this, <laughs> it's all rub public keys, which is really important. And I think the biggest piece is this does natively support on every platform. Now, the, the interesting thing about all this, right, is, you know, we believe you should be able to use every, any pass key provider you want, right? I don't use a native platform when I use Bitwarden, right? That's fine. Um, but we, what we do need in the platforms is a default experience for users without them having to buy something, right? This is like you can't use a device today if it doesn't have Wi-Fi, right, or a Wi-Fi driver. So we need to be the Wi-Fi driver to make sure that anyone who has not purchased a third-party provider, right, not everyone's going to be in, in the market for that, can have this base-level experience and sign in. If we didn't have that, we would never be able to replace passwords. They will always be, uh, always be the, the last option because of that problem. So they're natively supported on every platform now. You can use them on literally billions of devices now. Um, I think Andrew's slide, it was like 98 point something percent. Um, and that's due to a mix of software updates, platform updates, like it's, it's been a very busy couple of years, which is very exciting. So to, to wrap up here, and then we'll do a few questions. Um, Passkeys are phishing resistant, right? That's the biggest piece. You no longer have to layer on these other things to specifically address phishing, right? Like most of these deployments are these, these other things, these OTPs, these app pushes are layered on because of phishing. If this thing is phishing resistant in the first place, you can reevaluate your need to do these other factors. Um, it ends up resulting, you've seen probably some of the Google numbers uh, from their deployment, happier users, significantly lower costs, especially if you're using SMS. We learned about two years into this initiative to start talking about SMS costs because that's like, I mean, if, does anyone deal with that? How much your SMS? Yeah, okay. It's it's not as cheap as everyone thinks. <laughs> um, and the other, you know, the last piece I think the most important is that it ultimately leads to better account security. Start your journey towards passkeys. This whole week is pretty much dedicated towards passkeys. I think 90% of the sessions have passkey in the name. Um, and like I said, it's 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 now. I think if I stood here last year and said it's available everywhere I go try, I would have been maybe lying a little bit. This year it's there. You can go play with it. Um, and like Andrew said, we're still, or Megan said in the keynote, we're still cleaning up the edges, but it's ready to go. So I will take, uh, okay, it went fast. So I can take a few questions. We have about five minutes if there's any questions. Wow. Oh, hi. I went way faster. Can we grab a, I was gonna say, I can have, if you don't, okay, while you're doing that. Yeah, hi. Um, so I know, I'm not going to stand there. Um, I know you're Microsoft Windows guy, um, and you can use Windows Hello to auth to your client, right? Um, most of our fleet is Mac OS. Do you happen to know if Mac OS has plans of supporting uh, FIDO2 capable auth at laptop login? Does anybody know? Yeah. Or no? so not speaking for Apple, just to be very clear. Um, so if you, if you look at their WWDC presentation this year, it's part of the platform SSO feature, where you can actually, so version one of platform SSO allowed you to single sign on between the apps. Now you can actually sign into that same account, your enterprise account, at the login screen. So that it does require device management, but it is, uh, in many cases, I assume, those devices are going to be managed. So, yeah. and, there are, and to tie it in with that, just if you're not familiar either, um, Apple also announced this year um, you can have a managed iCloud keychain. So if you have an Apple ID that's federated to your IDP, that, uh, that keychain is essentially bound to your corporate credentials. So when it goes away, any pass keys created in that uh, keychain go away, right? So it's, it has a little bit more control over the user syncing to their personal iCloud account.
Thanks. Uh, what kind of uh, feedback or challenges have you heard from um, enterprise customers or workforce audience where administrators might not be able to have as much controls over these pass keys, especially when they are synced to multiple devices? And how do we you know, plan to solve that problem? Yeah, I, I think one of the things we hear the most is it's not the it's not the managed devices, it's the unmanaged devices that have some level of BYO involvement, right? Um, it's super interesting architecturally, right? They're all, all the platforms are very different, right? On Android, you have Android work profile, so it's a personal device, but this little partition is managed. You can do, you know, I, I'm of the mindset that you can make anything work if the device is managed. We can come up with some policy to turn something off, but it's really that gap where the device isn't fully managed. And I think that's where things like pluggable passkey providers come in, right? The ability to use your passkey provider, uh, a third party, uh, like for LastPass or Dashlane, being also able to use those as an enterprise passkey provider can provide some value, right? Having a, let's say, a device-bound passkey via a passkey provider that you can use in a roaming scenario could help, right? And then maybe I, it doesn't help the device that's uh, only as a consumer account, but it at least allows you to do a cross-device sign-in that's phishing resistant. Right. If you had, let's say you had, a, let's say you had a an app on your phone that could be a device-bound passkey provider, and using that to sign in, and then maybe bootstrap a device-bound credential on the other side. Yeah. Can you turn me up? Or turn me on? Hello. Oh, hello. I do have a question in the app, um, but then we do have a we do have time. Um, in the cross-device authentication bootstrapping scenario, let's say I have ten pass keys on my iPhone. Do I need to do once? fingerprint on iPhone to move all 10 on my iPhone to like a Windows desktop or is it like I have to move each one uh, manually? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So so in the cross device flow, the pass keys themselves are not moving. It's the it's the functional equivalent of plugging in a security key and using the security key. The key doesn't come off the key, right? The, 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 the credential itself doesn't come off the security key. An assertion is passed, you know, essentially a piece of data that's signed is passed between the two devices, right? So you would need to, if you had 10 different accounts, you would need to do that at least once per account uh, if you were signing in across device, because the credentials do not move as part of that process by design. I know uh, Microsoft is uh, also making a lot of investments in decentralized identity, verifiable credentials. I'd be interested in any either synergy or conflict sure. you see with that in this. Yeah, I, I'll clarify this as, I'll, this is Tim's opinion, not as I get in trouble for this, so <laughs> Tim's opinion. Uh, I, I think they are gonna work very well together, right? If you think about the way you have to initially bootstrap, especially in the enterprise, right? You have to call someone or your manager has to give you a code and that code is fishable, right? Like what if you could provide a verifiable credential and or, and or a mobile driver's license, right, during onboarding to your enterprise. And the first step you do after validating that is you enroll a passkey. To me, that's where all this comes together. Um, I do not see, personally, again, verifiable credentials and decentralized are not for authentication, in my opinion, right? They're for passing claims, right? Passkeys are for authentication. You augment that with claims data from other sources. Could be a verifiable credential, could be other things. Um, there are going to be use cases where VCs are used for sign-in. There are some parts of the world where the government is mandating it for some reason, um, and we're gonna have to support it, but that is not the, we don't want users using their mobile driver's license as one example to sign into Netflix, right? <laughs> like, that would be a nightmare scenario. I, I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, and unfortunately, there's only so much you can do with the technology layer to prevent that. But we ought to make passkeys buttery smooth, so it's really hard to say no to passkeys, right? That's one way. How much time do we have? Buttery smooth. You're good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so another question in the app, and then we do have time for that because we actually have five minutes in between, yeah. so we're good. Um, so this question is really about like thinking about passkeys in the context of like traditional MFA, meaning device-bound passkey and a synced passkey, do they meet the like traditional requirements of something you know, something sure. you have, yeah. et cetera? So that, that's all being worked out. Our, our hypothesis, at least, is that, yes, it does. We, we think passkeys will eventually meet AAL2 when Rev4 of, of NIST A-163 comes out. Um, there's a lot of asterisks after that, right? Um, what One of the things we're working on is like, how do you know that these passkeys were synced down to your device uh, using end-to-end -end encryption, right? How, how do we know they're end-to-end -end encrypted in transit? How do we know that there was two-step verification involved in restoring them? Those are all things we're iterating on in FIDO, but also, you know, helping these governmental organizations that drive these standards to uh, uh, 
advance the thinking, right? Like, unfortunately, again, like if we tomorrow, if we said tomorrow, rewrite NIST 863 with only pass keys in mind, right? It would be a very different document, right? Again, because we've layered on all these things because we've assumed the first factor is fishable. So, like I said, I think we're going to get to AL2. That's the hope. Um, we've been enhancing some of the uh, features and policy controls to, to try to make that a reality. Um, so stay tuned. That's all in progress. And talk to our NIST friends who are here if you have uh, some feedback about that. Yeah, I think there's, to the point of the question, there's some necessity to sort of rethink how we've looked at this, right? Because we're the foundational factor is now fishing resistant, which is not something. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea of factors five years from now, hopefully, maybe not. Maybe it's not even a term anymore. Yeah. Um, did you still have a question? This will have to be our last, yeah, I yeah. think. Okay. I usually take forever in my presentation, so I'm so proud we have some time. <laughs> My question related to the synced pass keys. Sure. So, for example, like uh, Apple case, iCloud Kitchen needs to be enabled, Google case, like a password manager, something, and uh, Microsoft also, right? Every 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 vendor they are coming up, they do have their own like a keychain mechanism is there. Do you have any plans to like sync up these ones, like iCloud to like a Google? Google to like Microsoft, all the so, sync, yeah. sync pass keys, right? Like again, user yeah. side, it's going to be multiple accounts need to be maintained. Yeah, so uh, speaking only for Microsoft, we have no plans to do inter-provider sync. We do have plans though to allow you to move providers if, if you choose to no longer do business with one company. And that's across the board, pass key provider, third party providers and the platforms. We've all kind of lowercase c committed because we're being recorded to do that. But we're working on it, that's literally, Later this week, that's what we're working on is how do we actually migrate. But yeah, the inter the inter provider sync gets really tough, right? Who can make a security statement about others, right? Like it, it, it gets really, I'm not sure we're really, anyone's really ready for that kind of thing yet. Uh, the, the user experience will be great, obviously, but I think we can clean up some of the other edges where that's not needed. Okay, thank you. All right, well, please help me to thank Tim, and I encourage you all to find him and ask yeah. him your additional questions. I, I think there is, yeah. Is there well, another one you want to take? Well, I was just going to say, I think there is another session right after, so I'm going to go outside if you have questions, so the next person can There get is. Ready. We have a couple yeah. minutes, but so um, really happy to hear some questions about enterprise. Um, one of the biggest questions that we get um, and that we're working on as an alliance is, how do pass keys, particularly sync pass keys, how do those play in the enterprise space? Um, and now I'm going to transition to here. Um, so let's just give everyone a minute to transition sessions. We do have a couple minutes, but and then we'll get started with our next session with Tom Sheffield from Target in about four minutes. <laughs> 